So welcome everyone. This is not the Republican National. No personal tax? I think we're anatomical comparison. Um, all of our speakers have big hands. <laughs> but uh, so the first debate today is on the topic of uh, whether or not the federal government should change the blood alcohol legal limit for intoxication from 0.08, which it is now, to 0.05. And the pro side will do the first argument. They will have 10 minutes to present their side. The cons are getting up and walking away. <laughs> we'll wait until everybody is seated. Notes. <laughs> and so uh, you will have 10 minutes. I will let you know when you have two minutes and one minute and so forth. And so the pro side can begin. Okay. So I'll start. We know that thousands of people are killed or injured every year by drunk drivers. I'm sure everyone in this room may have known somebody or have heard of somebody from high school or their community that's been involved or harmed by a drunk driving incident. Our first point we would like to make is that we see significant signs of impairment below 0.08, even though this is the legal limit. Um, we have some studies that show by um, Forentino and Muskowitz that um, they reviewed 112 articles in 2011. Um, and these articles looked back from 1981 to 1991. And they concluded from these articles that by the time a person um, reaches a blood alcohol level of 0.05, that there was significant impairment. They also found that after testing 168 drivers, that the majority of the driving population is impaired at least some, in at least some important measures at blood alcohol content um, as low as 0.02. So the National Transportation Safety Board has reported that at levels at like 0.05, drivers begin having issues with depth perception, other visual functions, and then at 0.07, they may begin to have cognitive, um, cognitive abilities be impaired. Another group of people, Howitt, Sleet, and Smith, conducted reviews in 1991 that also found that there are significant impairments in driving performances at blood alcohol content of 0.05 or lower. Furthermore, they found that young and inexperienced drinkers appear to be at the greatest risk at this level of 0.05, which is our population that have the most drunk driving accidents, actually. Our second point is that the cost of drunk driving is truly enormous. In 1998, alcohol was involved in approximately 2.7 million car crashes, according to the CDC. Um, and then according to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, they estimate that a singular drunk driving fatality can cost the country um, approximately 3.2 million in monetary losses. So when you extrapolate that, that comes out to be an estimated 45 billion annu annually lost and injuries cost more than 110 billion each year. Okay, so um, a lot of this lowering the legal limit from 0 0.08 to 0 0.05 stemmed from seeing how other countries um, regulate traffic safety and um, Worldwide, there's actually 91 countries that hold that limit or lower. So in Japan, Norway, Russia, and Sweden, they've actually found it advantageous to hold their limit at 0 0.02, which is a lot lower than what we hold here at 0 0.08. Um, worldwide organizations, such as the World Medical Association, the American Medical Association, and the World Health Organization, just to name a few, also support lowering the limit to 0 0.05 for a variety of reasons. Um, the relative risk of being killed in a car crash due to drunk driving is actually seven times greater when your blood alcohol content is between 0 0.05 to 0 0.079. So that's seven times compared to a sober driver, and that's um, under our legal limit of 0 .08. So there's still a risk of driving under the level of 0 .08. The um, National Traffic and Safety Board 
estimated that if you, we were to lower to 0.05, thousands of lives could be saved each year. They, um, pro when they proposed this policy, the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety surveyed drivers and 63% of them supported lowering the limit to 0.05. So there's also um, ev scientific evidence that backs up the safety of lowering that limit to 0.05, but there's also safety um, in the public from our drivers and um, from the community that would also support this level. In a meta-analysis, um, there, in a meta-analysis of 14 independent studies in the United States, they indicated that when we lowered our limit in the United States from 0.10 to 0.08, we saw a 5 to 16 percent reduction in alcohol-related crashes, fatalities, and injuries. So, going off of this data, we're assuming that by lowering it even further we'll see even more reduction in alcohol-related fatalities. Um, from this study, looking at the relative risk of being involved in a fatal crash, a driver is four to 10 times uh, more likely to be impaired when they're between 0 0.05 and 0 0.07. So the takeaway point from looking at these studies and really assessing the difference between 0 0.08 and 0 0.05 was that there is still significant impairment um, and this is affecting people on the road because they, um, you really don't know what your limit is walking out of the bar or wherever you are. There's still gonna be like, like no matter how much you drink or how little you think that you drink, you can't really still be going off of the fact that you think you're okay by lowering it. They think that they're going to um, kind of make people more conscious of how much they're drinking and how dangerous it really is. Okay, and I'm just gonna go through several of the studies in the meta-analysis and uh, present the data. Um, a study in 1994 by uh, Nord, uh, the percentage of drivers with BACs from greater than 0.05 from roadside surveys decreased from more than 15% in the years before the 0.05 limit to 2%. In the, to, it decreased from 15% to 2% when they reduced the legal limit to 0.05 um, in, in the first year and then leveled off at around 12% um, 10 years after the law changed. Um, another study that was done um, by Smith um, they saw a significant 8.2% reduction in nighttime serious injury crashes and a 5.5% reduction in nighttime property damage um, when they lowered the limit from 0.08 to 0.05. Um, and the next point I'm going to make is that alcohol-related crashes are actually maybe understated. Um, so emergency room doctors and nurses um, reported that um, drunken driving is gross understated because very few injured, intoxicated drivers are arrested once they enter a trauma center. Um, when drunken drivers are killed in car crashes, hospitals can release their blood alcohol levels to police investigators. But if the drivers are only injured and go to the hospital emergency room, their chances of being arrested or even having their BAC levels checked by police are slim to none. Even if the accident causes deaths or other injuries, in fact, some studies show as few as 5% of injured, drunken drivers admitted to trauma centers are ever charged with the DUI. Um, another study reported 30% to 50% of injured drivers were drinking just before arriving at the emergency room, and the overwhelming majority have blood, intact, blood alcohol levels well above 0.1, uh, which would make them legally drunk in all 50 states. Um, and finally, privacy laws prevent ER doctors from proactively notifying police that a driver they are treating appears drunk or tested positive for alcohol. Uh, the investigating officer or witness must no have noticed signs of drunkenness by the driver, and the officer must go to the ER and demand a blood sample that can be tested at a police lab. And finally, um, the public at large supports lowering the BAC. Um, as Layla mentioned, 63% support lowering it. And then another survey um, said that most Americans believe that you should not drink and, drink and drive after drinking more than three drinks 
which is equivalent to approximately 0.05 in most people. So considering this reported attitude, the public favors the VAC limit of 0.05, and the countries that have already adopted the 0.05 VAC as their limit do not report any public outcry um, when they did this. Thank you very much, and now we'll hear from the con side. All right. I want to first start out by saying that uh, our team wholeheartedly agrees with a lot of what the pro side is saying in, in this debate. Uh, alcohol, uh, drunk driving is an epidemic in this country. Although it's been declining in the last three decades, there's still way too many deaths, way too many fatalities uh, associated with drinking and driving. Uh, that's, that's an argument that I think everybody can agree on. Uh, in this room, I'm sure everybody agrees with that. Uh, AAA survey uh, in 2013 stated that 96% of Americans believe that drinking and driving is unacceptable behavior. So it's, it's, that is not the issue. The issue is what is the best strategy for preventing deaths, preventing accidents? Um, I would argue that 0.08 to 0.05 is not doing that much. We're spending a lot of time and a lot of effort to get this pushed through, and we could just be spending our resources elsewhere. Who else agrees with me? Uh, Candace Leitner, she's the uh, founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She does not believe that this policy should be pushed through. She has dedicated her whole life to stopping drunk driver accidents. She has lost her daughter to a drunk driver. Uh, she is against this policy. Uh, Gary Bilner, he is the president of the National Motorist Association. He is also against this policy. He spends his whole life ad advocating for safe driving, and he is against this policy. Um, this policy, it, it sounds great, you know, we're going to lower the legal limit and we're going to have less deaths, but the motive may be pure, the logic is not there, and I will uh, give a quick demonstration of the flawed logic, and I'm going to use the whiteboard real quick, guys. So impairment at 0.05 is not 100%, not everybody is impaired at, at 0.05, a lot of social figures have built up a lot of tolerance and not, they don't actually exhibit signs of impairment. So arbitrarily, let's assume... 50% of people are impaired and 50% are not. That's not really relevant, but we'll just assume 50%. So we got 50% of people impaired, 50 unimpaired. According to Michigan State law, if you show any sign of impairment uh, while driving, you can be arrested regardless of VAC. So currently, under current law, these people can already be arrested and prosecuted. They're already breaking the law by driving while impaired. The other social responsible drinkers that are driving not impaired, they are getting home safe, they're, they're not breaking the law at all. When we change the law down to 0.05, the only thing we are doing effectively is criminalizing these responsible drivers. These people that are driving safe and drinking responsibly are now able to be arrested and prosecuted. So my argument is that we have other effective measures that we can, that we can focus our efforts on and that uh, a lot of people in the in that uh, community advocating for safe driving would agree with me. Some of those measures, uh, fortunately for us, Dr. C went over in great detail in one of his lectures, and um, so I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things here before I, I list a couple of these. Is that um, the data has proven that you know decreasing from 0.1 to 0 0.08, you know really didn't have that effect on the death fatalities from car crashes from, since 1991. So uh, decreasing it to 0 0.08 across the board in 2000 um, didn't have a major <coughs> effect. So why don't we focus on something that, that would have a, a real effect? And some of these solutions include um, law enforcement and penalty increasing, standardizing the tests, um, you know, roadside so sobriety tests, carding, um, increasing policies, um, increasing awareness through um, you know, sources like MAD, um, increased use of DDs. Uh, I like that shame plates idea. Um, you can increase legal age. Age has been proven to be heavily uh, correlated with um, drinking and driving, crashes and fatalities. Uh, I think that could be um, a, a major point that you could try to, um, to decrease driving fatalities. Uh, decreasing per se limits, although Michigan has a per se limit is if you are, have any in you and you're impaired, you can be prosecuted for it. Um, and you can increase car safety 
which will increase crashes and fatalities overall, and that's not going to save the person who's being irresponsible by drinking and driving too much. Um, and then you can also um, decrease demand for drinking and driving, um, and, and there's multiple ways to do that. One of them, I guess, could be doing T THC at home and not driving. What? I don't know why that was in the slides, but um, so <laughs> basically, um, yeah, the, the fatalities haven't decreased um, significantly since 91, although the blood alcohol level legal limits have decreased. And, um, and you want to? To add up to what Scott already said, I would like to present some of the data uh, that we have here. So. Uh, uh, according to the FARS report from the uh, National Highway Traffic Administration, driver, both men and women involved in the fatal uh, crashes, having BAC of 0 0.01 or higher, have fairly remained constant. So it doesn't matter you have 0 0.05 or 0 0.08. Even if you uh, break down the stats and separate the uh, group from lower than the 0 0.08 and higher or 0 0.08, the stats remain the same over the last 10 years. Nothing has changed really much. The number of the crashes are the same. And the critical analysis of the FARS report provides uh, provide us the fact that uh, people, persons killed in the crash in 2013, 63% people were killed by the BAC, mind it, BAC having 0, 0.00, means they have no alcohol in their body, and still they are responsible for killing 63% uh, of the persons involved in the fatal uh, accident. And as compared, only 36% of the death were contributed from 0 0.01 to 0 0.08. Again, just to uh, ma make it to fact that 0 0.08 and 0 0.05, they don't really matter from each other. Uh, the only BAC safe limit is 0 0.00. Any alcohol more than 0 0.00 would cause impairments, as my other team members were telling that 0 0.05 is uh, different than 0 0.08. But the statistics cannot uh, differentiate between these two uh, limits. And uh, also, like uh, for as a counterfact to their facts they were presenting, almost uh, for the expenditure on the drunk driving, uh, three quarters of the total of the alcohol misuse is related to binge drinking, and out of the total people who drink the binge, only 24.6% of the people age 18 or older report that they engage in binge, binge, binge drinking in the past month. So that's from where the most of the alcohol misuse uh, costs are coming from, from the binge drinking, not the other 80% people who are drinking uh, just regular alcohol use. Uh, Adding to this, I would just like to say that blaming alcohol for accidents is not fact proven at all. In year 2013, total number of fatalities in the road accidents increased by 3%, whereas uh, compared to 2012, whereas during the same year, fatality due to drunk driving haven't changed really much. Uh, Mark Roskind is a board member of the National Transport Safety Board, and according to him, blood le alcohol level higher than 0.05 increased the risk of fatal crash significantly, and 0.05 the chances of killing of being killed under the wheel are 38% higher than driving sober because the level most drivers have impaired alertness and vision responses. That's so we also have to consider what's the cost of enforcing decrease in the blood alcohol limit. We have to discover, you know, how are people supposed to be able to monitor their own limits and when it's so small at this point, it's a very small discrepancy, you have to ask yourself, Who's paying for these studies that are showing alcohol as such a bad guy? People that want to show the alcohol as a bad guy, and and the studies. I guess are, instead of lowering BAC, we should increase alcohol excise taxes or may reduce the alcohol outlet density. Also, reducing the days and the hours of alcohol sale might reduce the number of the drunk driving instead of just reducing the limit from 0 0.08 to 0 0.05. And lastly, we're going to end on a quote from Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> the great. The great Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> That says, those who would sacrifice liberty for more security deserve neither. Deserve neither. Well, That's thank it. you all. <laughs> <laughs>